Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here today to give you a little bit of a different episode, more of an instructional episode on something that has been helpful to me and uh, I think can be helpful to you as well. And that's how to read the standard MTF chart that is given by uh, basically all lens manufacturers when they represent the performance of their lens in a chart form. So I'm going to give you a breakdown, some visual representation of how to read these charts, also to tell you what you can get out of it and maybe what you really can't read out of something like this. So first of all, let me just detail a little bit of why I, I think that there is some value to being able to read an MTF chart, even if you're not a gear reviewer like myself. However, I'll start that explanation by telling you why it's been helpful to me. When I get a piece of, of gear, I really like to have a manufacturer's MTF chart because it gives me some kind of baseline to evaluate whether or not the lens that I have is performing up to the specification as given from the manufacturer. And being able to effectively read MTF charts tells me what I should expect. And sometimes it's reassuring because if I see something that is maybe a little bit unexpected, maybe a weaker performance in the corner, for example. If I can look at an MTF chart and say, oh, okay, yes, the manufacturer says that's the way this lens is going to perform, it's useful to me. It feels like I'm giving, that, that my findings are consistent with what I should be finding. And if I see a major deviation from that, it allows me to go back to the manufacturer and say, you know what, the, the MTF charts suggest a certain kind of performance that I'm not really seeing from this lens. And in some cases, of course, I see a performance that's maybe a little bit better than what I would expect represented from the MTF chart. So it's to say it's obviously not an exact science because an MTF chart is hopefully a representative of not just one copy of a lens, but an aggregation of a number of them. But it's definitely not the lens that you're holding in your hand at the moment. And so for those of you that are making a big investment into a new lens, one of the nice things about an MTF chart is that if you do a little bit of you know educated testing of the lens yourself, and you don't have to have sophisticated charts to do that, but basically if you have some means of of evaluating whether the performance is roughly what you should expect from the MTF chart, it can give you some reassurance to say, okay, I got a good copy, as we sometimes say. And so in, in that case, I think being able to read an MTF chart is very useful. And of course, if you're comparing multiple lenses and lens sharpness is important to you, being able to evaluate the MTF results and say, okay, this lens is going to work for what I need it to be, or maybe it's sharp enough where I need it to be, uh, looking at the, you know, the curve of performance performance, then it will allow you to, to make an ed a more educated decision on what piece of gear is going to work for you. So I'm going to actually demonstrate some MTF charts here uh, from some various lenses, well-known lenses, both expensive and inexpensive, and to give you a bit of a baseline of performance uh, for understanding how to read an MTF chart. Let's dive in and take a look. So one of the first things I want to address is that often people are told that MTF charts are basically useless because they vary from manufacturer to manufacturer. That is only true in my experience in the most limited kind of way. Yes, the data is sometimes presented a little bit different way. Here's from Sigma, their most recent 35 millimeter f1.4 DN for Sony and Leica. But you can see that they have a diffraction and a geometrical MTF chart. But the truth of the matter is that if you look at these two charts, they behave you know, very nearly identically. And so if you can read even just one of them, you're going to get pretty much the same kind of information. What's important is that there's always going to be a baseline of this 10 LP and this 30 LP. And so it is always good to get a bit of a key there to understand what the information that's on there. But to make this very, very simple, uh, the 10 LP represents a kind of a very low resolution sensor. And so that's going to be much less demanding. And the 30 LP represents a, you know, a higher resolution sensor. Uh, maybe not as high as, you know, a Sony A7R Mark IV, but very typically I find this is the more relevant, the lower one is the more relevant bit of information um, in with today's modern cameras for the most part. And so in this case, you would basically interpret this if you're speaking on a Canon sense, you know, the difference between between an R6 with 20 megapixels and an R5 with 45 megapixels, you know, it's going to be, R5 is going to be much more like this. The R6 might be a little bit closer to this. Somewhere in between is the more likely. 
Now here we're looking at a Sony representation, and we're going to come back to the 135 GM. But you know, yes, the information is presented slightly differently, but we've still got the 10 and the 30 line pairs that are represented in these two lines. And in this case, uh, there's also a wide open f1.8, and then Sony gives us the stop down f at f8, and that information is all there if you just you know basically look for it as a part of this. So in number four, you see connects to this we have f8 aperture and so um, we'll come back to that and explain it all more in just a moment so here we're going to use the 35 millimeter f1.8 from sony a popular and you know fairly well circulated lens at a moderate price point this is the canadian price point and so i mean it's not a terribly expensive lens so here to help you to further read these charts is that starting on the left side this represents the center of the frame and the far right side represents the extreme corner of the frame and so what you're going to see is a progression across the sensor and so you know somewhere about here you're at the midpoint of the sensor and then over to the corner of the sensor and obviously the higher the lines are the better and so you can see always that the you know the lower resolution is going to present higher because there's less demands being put on the lens optics whereas the higher uh, the higher resolution is going to put more demand on those optics and so in this case it's kind of an interesting MTF in that you can see that in the center of the frame we've got about a 78 percent uh, performance resolving of a maximum of 100%. And you can see that actually, um, as you get just a little bit off center, that resolution line actually rises, which is fairly unique in my experience. Then you see a you know fairly typical drop off towards the mid frame that progresses towards the corner. Now that solid line represents your kind of baseline resolution, whereas the dotted line underneath represents contrast. And so the closer these are together, the higher the contrast that you're going to see. And, and so down here, you see that, you know, at about three quarters of the way out of the frame, interestingly, we actually have an intersection of these two lines at f1.8, which means that while the overall resolution is lower, you know, it's going to look maybe better than what you might expect because contrast is is matching that and is fairly good and uh, here at f8 you can see that you know that the the lower resolution we're not perfect but you know almost perfect in terms of resolution with just a little bit of a drop off in, in contrast as you get towards the edge of the frame but you can also see a fairly strong performance at f8 to where you're very very sharp I mean anything above 80 percent there is is incredibly sharp and so it's very sharp with you know contrast just lagging a little bit behind that a very strong performance but what happens if you introduce something like the G master into the equation? So just quickly with these side by side, you can see reading these two that whereas the uh, the 35 millimeter f1.8 starts at about 78 percent the g master is starting at more like 90 percent and whereas the f1.8 in lens in somewhere near the 50 percentile range at the edge of the frame we can see with the g master that it actually ends at 78 or so basically where it's at, so the g master is as sharp at f1.4 in the extreme corner as what the f1.8 lens is in the very center of the frame and of course if we close that down and we'll take a, a bigger look here you can see that the g master lens when it is stopped down all the lines are just jacked right up to the top which tells you that this is a lens that is essentially perfect um, at f8 there's just a very very tiny bit of, of drop in contrast but it's it's very very close to perfect now, if you want to talk about a lens that is near perfection, let's come back to that 135 millimeter f1.8 G Master lens. And so we can see that you're starting at about 95 percentile. It actually probably rises to about 96 percentile, just a little off center. But at its very worst, it is basically 80th percentile, even at f1.8. And look at this. You can see that there's basically no separation between the you know primary resolution and the contrast you know value here. And so what you're going to see is that this is a lens that has just incredible resolution and contrast all across the frame. And much like we saw with the 35 uh, millimeter G Master lens, at F8 it is basically just perfect um, all across the frame. These, this is, these are very, very, very good numbers.
Now, at the other end of the spectrum of not so sharp and high contrast wide open, you have a lens like the uh, old Canon 50 millimeter f1.0. And so here, and this gets a little bit more confusing, which is why I saved it for later, because Canon uh, used to put all of this information on one chart. And so you see both a stop down performance, which are going to be the lines that are higher here, and then the uh, you know wide open performance. So what we can see here is that at its very best on a low resolution sensor, you're getting, you know, okay performance in the center of the frame and terrible performance by the corner of the frame. Now, if you're on a more typical camera, like what anyone is using, you're very, very, very soft, um, starting wide open, only about 33%. And at its lowest, you are down here near about 6% of resolving power. And with a little bit of a, a rise towards extreme corner, but only getting up to about 8%. So this is a lens that is not going to present as very sharp. In fact, even at its very best, when stopped way down, where we go back up to this thinner blue line here, what you're going to see is that, you know, contrast is still very low even with the lens stopped down to f8 and so you know that does give you some very useful information about how the lens behaves and obviously this is a profile that's going to present as euphemistically called dreamy with a big separation between you know these two lines which shows low contrast and and so that's going to present a very very different than the highly corrected g master lenses now this is also a useful thing if you compare side by side, particularly when you're working with the same manufacturer, when you see about a new like budget lens. So Canon brought out a new RF version of their 50 millimeter f1.8. And here we have the older EF version of the 50 millimeter f1.8. And while, you know, the, you know, the rumor out there was is that the, the optics were recycled in the lens, while we can see that there is some similarity in the way that they present, they don't behave exactly. And so that tells you that there is actually room for a little bit of improvement here. So whereas as the older lens started you at about 67, 68%, here we have a much more reasonable 73%, which means in the center of the frame, this lens is pretty sharp. Now, where they present more similarly is off near the edge of the frame, where you see that they drop to a lower level. And the way that they kind of, the contrast curve in the middle of the frame varies a little bit along the way. And so while this does present as a similar optical formula, it's clear that Canon has tweaked things a little bit um, to where it behaves just a little bit differently and you get a little bit more center performance. And so an interesting thing that you can read just from the MTF chart itself. Now, even more interesting is what Canon has done with its its actual new optical formulas with some of its new RF lenses compared to the you know previous EF version of lenses. And so here for looking at higher resolution, which this is really the only figure probably worth looking at most of the time for you, you can see that the new RF lens, it starts off very sharp, about 88%. And at its worst, it's still very, very good um, here at, oh, about 53%. And you can see that, you know, in the center of the frame, contrast is perfect. And as you move out towards the edge, there's a little bit more separation, but contrast still remains pretty strong here overall. Whereas the older lens, obviously, you started at a much lower resolution level, about 58%. And at the edge of the frame, you are considerably worse. You're down to about 28%. And so what you're going to find is that the, you know, the new lens, once again, is basically as sharp in the very edge of the frame is what the old lens was in the center of the frame. Very, very little difference there. And so, you know, again, we see that steady improvement in terms of resolution of optical design. The same is true, but in a probably even a more extreme way, if you compare the new RF 50 millimeter f1.2 to the older EF 50 millimeter f1.2. Whereas in this case, you can see that once again, the RF lens, uh, even at f1.2, that huge aperture is still quite sharp, even in the very corner of the frame with good resolution or good contrast overall. And in the center of the frame, it is exceptionally sharp. Whereas the old lens, it had a uh, more line separation, you know, so a drop of contrast and also you can see it ended up at a very low resolution point out near the edge of the frame. So in all of these, you can see, you can make some educated, you know, not just guesses, but you can be educated as to the performance of the lens and what you're looking for from it.
So hopefully that has helped you to kind of see some of the comparison points and maybe those, you know, squiggly lines to make a little bit more sense. You know, it's, it's a little bit more complicated than the way that I've presented it here, but I've tried to give it in a simplified form uh, to help you to understand that. Now, here's where an MTF chart is not useful. Just knowing the resolution in contrast of a, a lens, you know, or a suggested performance for that, tells you really nothing about the character of a lens. A lens can be very, uh, it can be very sharp when shown on an MTF chart or even on a, you know, a reviewer's test charts, but that doesn't really give you a sense of the rendering of the lens out in the real world. Um, you know, maybe put in different lighting, less ideal lighting situations, a lens doesn't behave as well. And I found that to be true, for example, of the, uh, the previous generation Sigma 85 millimeter F1.4 art for DSLRs and that it, it MTF'd fantastically well, but wasn't quite as good as that in real life because in real life lighting situations, there are a bit more aberrations that robbed it of some contrast. And so, you know, that can play in, but also just the quality of the rendering, how it, you know, presents colors, the out of focus areas of a lens, all of those factors are not going to be shown in an MTF chart. However, the MTF chart, if you can read it, does help you to at least have a starting point. And then you can maybe go and look at photos taken with a, a lens, even if you don't have a chance to personally test it. You can go and look at photos and say, okay, do I like the overall look of images that uh, this you know, lens can produce? The downside of that, of course, is that there are always, when you're looking at other people's photos, there's certain variables at play. You know, their, their personal technique, not only in you know, using light, but then also in editing their photos these days. And so, you know, you have to take some, some of that with a bit of a grain of salt, but certainly being able to read an MTF chart can be a very useful skill as a photographer if you're interested in evaluating or purchasing new gear. And I hope that this little video has helped you to have a greater understanding of the science behind reading an MTF chart. I'm Dustin Abbott, and if you'll look in the description down below, you can find all the typical links to follow me on social media, become a patron, sign up for my newsletter, and uh, purchase my merchandise. And if you haven't already, please click that subscribe button, and, and so you can get, and be sure to ring the bell so you get notifications when new content drops. Thanks for watching, have a great day, and let the light in.